Thank you very much uh, for your interesting talk, Daniel. And um, I'm going to speak now about the characteristics of terracotta figurines from the Temple Mount soil, which were found in our project. Uh, so I've been uh, working on this project basically since the beginning in 2004 and even before that. And I've been, uh, one of the things I've been working on is the, the publication of the figurine fragments that have been found in this project since the beginning, since 2004, and up until about 2016. So figurine fragments that were found during 12 years of this uh, project, of the Temple Mount Sifting project. Um, of course, others have been found since, they're always being found, and I'll get to them at some point, maybe in a second chapter, you know, but we had to make a cut somewhere. Um, so these, so these figurines are from all kinds of different periods. Uh, we're going to focus today on the ones from the first temple period. Okay, so that's the Iron Age two. Um, so approximately from 1000, right, that's the establishment of the first temple until the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE. Okay, but before that, I just want to, uh, for those of you, you know, I know most of you have been following some of these. A moment. I've been following some of these lectures. You know the story of the project, uh, but perhaps some others have uh, just joined us now. So just to, uh, you know, put you in context here, we're sifting earth that comes from this area over here of Sodom and Stables in the southeastern corner of the Temple Mount that came when a large illegal excavation took place just to the north of Sodom and Stables, uh, taking out hundreds of truckloads of earth. And that's actually what we're sifting in our project uh, with earth that contains material from all of the history uh, of Jerusalem, basically. Okay, so here's another image. You can see this is where uh, the new uh, uh, the new staircase was built. This is the large pit that was built right over here. And even from other areas, the, the platform of the Temple Mount was slightly lowered and earth was taken out of there as well. Okay, these are photos, images that were taken in November of 1999 when this uh, took place. Okay, Solomon Stables are in here. Okay, and this earth has been sifted uh, in the Tsurim Valley. Today we have a new site where things are being sifted and you can see here, this is wet sifting. Uh, so everything is put into buckets and most of the job is done by, uh, by volunteers and tourists who come and take their buckets, pour them on a, on a sifter and use uh, water and high pressure to uh, clean the material that, which allows us to find even the smallest uh, remains. Okay, so before getting to the Iron Age, right, the figurines that we're gonna focus on today, I just wanted to bring a few images of uh, small figurines, small little statues that were found from later periods, okay? Uh, and some of these are undeciphered. We really don't know much about them. Uh, so you can see here a cool little uh, small marble uh, head of a figurine. Here's a base of another figurine, which may be in Roman style. This, this one over here seems like a, a wing of an angel. Over here we have like a, a hand, perhaps holding a shaft or something like that. Here we have some hollow uh, figurines, okay? And this one is, became quite famous. I think it was already published of a small little uh, um, Roman style uh, head of a goat, which may be connected to the God of Pan, okay? Um, which like, is in Roman style. This one over here in the corner is a horse of Byzantine style, a hollow zoomorphic vessel, as we call them. And here in this last image, before I get to the Iron Age, you can see nice examples of early Islamic hollow zoomorphic vessels. Okay, so these are hollow vessels, which were, uh, uh, most of them seem to be donkeys or, or horses, and they were basically hollow. So you would pour the water or liquid through one hole and then uh, pour it out through their mouth or snout. And these were probably used in some sort of a, a cultic uh, uh, ritual during the early Muslim period. Okay, so Iron Age or Iron Age Two. So the Iron Age Two uh, has, is well represented in our in our project. Uh, perhaps you've heard some of this in other um, talks 
earlier today, including by, by our co-director, Tzachi Zweig. Uh, we have many, um, many uh, uh, pottery shirts from this time period, an arrowhead from the time of the destruction of the first temple, from the time of uh, uh, 586 BCE over here, okay, which belonged to the Babylonian army. We have a few bulas, uh, stamp seals, this one being the most famous one which has on it, you know, uh, the name of the family, one of the 24 priestly families that worked in the temple. Um, and of course, there are many, many other, uh, other finds from this time period. And among them are, are, are our 177 fragments of uh, figurines of all types, okay? So what are these figurines in general? So this phenomena is very, um, oops, is very uh, well known in, uh, in the archaeology of, uh, of the land of Israel. Okay. Um, and figurines are found in basically any site uh, that's dated to the Iron Age II, uh, that's excavated in Judah and beyond Judah, has uh, these fragments of, um, of figurines, including in the city of David, okay, where these images are from, okay, these images uh, just to the south of the Temple Mount. Most of the uh, figurines that are found belong to zoomorphic figurines, okay, like these here on top. Uh, according to their shape of the snout of the ears, we assume that most of them are horses. Uh, but other animals are represented as well. Uh, um, cattle and birds, etc. We also have the type, the, uh, which is more rare, of horse and rider figurines, like these down over here, which basically they placed a rider which looks like a male rider on these horses. Okay, so you can see here part of the male holding, hugging basically the neck of the horse. Okay, and this example over here, and these are two other examples of the, of the rider, which was found by, by himself off of the horse, basically. Uh, we have also examples of furniture, which are found like th this bed over here, examples of, of these bird figurines, and Similar to the, to the halozoomorphic figurines that I showed you earlier from the early Islamic period, we have these also during the Iron Age too. Okay, so that's this group over here, uh, which also some of them maybe, some of them are horses as well as other animals and they're hollow. So same idea as I said before, you could pour the liquid into one hole and then pour it out from another hole. Now, a minority of these uh, uh, figurines are anthropomorphic, or what we call Judite pillar figurines. Okay, these are a few examples uh, from the Israel Museum. And uh, even though these are a minority among all of the figurines, because most of them are zoomorphic, okay, or represent animals, these, of course, attracted much more attention. Okay, so these are usually about, uh, uh, they're called pillar figurines. You can see why. They paid more attention to the upper part of the body and less to the lower part. Uh, they, we have two types. They're about 13 to 16 centimeters tall. Most of them have a pinched head, like these over here. So very, very simple. It would just pinch the head. Uh, but others, a minority of them, have a head uh, uh, that was actually uh, created in a more uh, sophisticated, uh, sophisticated way, separately, and then placed on top of the same type of pillar figurine. You can see that they all have uh, exaggerated breasts and they're holding, uh, they're holding their breasts. So these, obviously these, these are women. And there are many, many studies that were written about these also by archeologists and biblical scholars trying to understand what, what, are, what are these, what do they represent, okay? So dealing with their identification, symbolic or cultic significant, significance, biblical connection and how they were used, okay? So, this is really just a very sh short summary, I would say, of the different theories out there, okay? So in terms of identification, uh, some people believe that they represent a local goddess, okay? Either Ashtoret or Asherah, who may have been the consort of Yahweh, of the Judahite god, or maybe another goddess. Others think that it's actually, they represent a human figure, maybe the woman herself, the woman who lived in the house and she created an image of herself or an image of, image of herself was created. And of course, these were tried, these were, they tried to connect these to biblical terms. Now that's not very easy. We're, no one is really sure what the biblical term for these 
uh, small figurines are. So we have a story or a couple of stories where teraphim are mentioned, uh, uh, which seem to be these small statues uh, that people could carry, uh, could carry with them. Um, in terms of their use, so most people think that they had a cultic use, okay? That they were used in the private homes, mostly by women, okay? Again, and now it's not clear if this was sort of tolerated by the official religion or maybe even part of it, okay? People could, maybe they went to the temple, you know, or to the main high places to do one type or certain type of worship, but at home they had another type of worship, okay? Or was it idol worship that was really frowned upon all the time? By the, uh, by the centralized government. Uh, were these used for fertility and birth, okay? To bestow uh, luck on the people that lived in these, in these houses, okay? Uh, some people think that they're erratic, okay? Uh, um, maybe talismans against the evil eye uh, that people would just place on the windowsill or near the door, maybe when they were sick, maybe when uh, uh, the woman was pregnant and delivering the baby. Well, others really suggested that these were just toys and they really had no cultic or any special sort of spiritual uh, meaning. Now, the interesting thing about these figurines is that they're all found broken. Besides a few that were found within uh, tombs and so they were kept complete, but all of the ones that are found in a, a domestic context are found broken. And also here, there's a big debate about why, what is the reason for this? So. Some have written that the, some theorize that they broke naturally, okay, just like pottery vessels are also almost all found broken. So these are also found broken. Um, yeah. Others think that they were broken intentionally as part of the ritual, okay? So if they were built when the women uh, were, were giving birth or were sick, but then when she got better or, or after she gave birth, they were broken. They, that was the end of their use. There was no, there was no need to keep them to keep them for the future, or maybe it was actually important to break them at this point. And uh, last, others thought that they're found broken because of the religious reforms that are mentioned in the Bible by Kings Hezekiah and Josiah. Okay, we read in the second book of Kings and the second book of Chronicles of their religious reforms where they uh, really destroyed all of the, the statues and the high places all around Judah because they were against what was supposed to be done, which is worship God only in one spot on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And some people thought that perhaps all of these broken, you know, figurines have to do with these reforms. Uh, of course, this is quite problematic to, uh, uh, to prove. First of all, these are found broken already, you know, beginning from before the time of King Hezekiah. And it's also impossible in archaeology to differentiate between, you know, the time of Hezekiah, the time of Josiah, and 586 BCE, which is, you know, the de destruction layer or the, the end of the first temple period. So it seems that they continue to be used even later after these reforms. And um, it's an interesting, of course, interesting idea, but it's very uh, difficult to prove. Okay. So now let's get to our uh, bigger pillar figurines. Okay, so we said that we found a total of 177 pillar figurines here. Nineteen of them were anthropomorphic, okay, belong to human figurines or JPFs as we call them, Judite pillar figurines. We have 16 body parts, okay, uh, there are three heads. You can see two of the heads here, one head over here, two head over here, the second head over here. These are pinched, and we found one fragment, okay, uh, of this uh, more sophisticated uh, head over here, just a small fragment, okay, uh, over there. And then we have, of course, what seems to be an arm and perhaps a little breast over here. Here are some of the bodies, okay, bases and torsos of these pillar figurines. moment. Okay. In terms of zoomorphic figurines, these, of course, are uh, constitute the majority of the figurine fragments that we found. Uh, 21 of them are heads, including horses. Okay, the default is horses, three cows, one sheep, and one unique lion's head. Okay, you can see that one over here. Okay, you can see 
uh, the small ears, this uh, uh, perhaps a mane in the back over here, the uh, extended jaw, lower jaw in front, and we uh, consulted with a, with a zoologist and he agrees that this is, perhaps, could be a, 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 a lioness. Okay, now there are a few other lions that were found from this time period, all were found in Jerusalem. So this is a, an interesting uh, phenomenon. Okay, here are some more heads. Okay, some more heads. And, oops, sorry, and here you can see two horns or ears. Okay, we found a few of these. We're the only project that discovered these because of our wet sifting process, okay? In most other uh, projects, they don't find these. They're too small. They're thrown out, basically. Okay, here are again a few uh, torsos and, and body parts, hindquarters, forequarters, and, and necks, and of course many, many legs, okay, of these equids or horses. We have four fragments of horses and riders, okay, if you remember from, the, from earlier, uh, here's the neck of the horse with the hand, sort of the arm on it, holding it, and here's uh, the body of a rider who was detached from the horse. We have a few holozoomorphic uh, vessels and bird figurines that we found in our project as well. well. Not so many, just a few of each. These are those hollow horses up here. And these are three um, birds. Okay, and this is just sort of a summary of what we found. So you can see that half of, half of what we found were animal legs, okay, of the identified ones. Okay, a bunch of them, we could tell that they were from the first temple period but we, they were so small or, or, or broken that we couldn't really determine what they're from. So we put them aside and then we summarize all this. You can see a few horses and riders. 14% of these were JPFs, the Judaic pillar figurines. 15% were animals' heads and 18% were animal bodies. Okay, so that's a summary of what we found there. Keep that in mind. And now we're gonna, for a moment, we're gonna turn our attention to another site that whose earth was also uh, um, sifted in our project, okay? This is a small site, which may have been mentioned earlier also in Tzachi's lecture, uh, what we call P56. It's on the Eastern slope of the Temple Mount, down in what we call the Franciscan Garden, okay? And in preparation for one of the Pope's speeches there, uh, there was a small excavation to try to redo some of the terraces there and they happened upon the pit, which was full of Iron Age II material. And luckily, that material was brought over to our sifting site and was sifted by us, so we could find all the pieces. And um, these are, you can see, this is a representation of the figurine fragments that were found at that project. In general, they're a little bit larger, okay? They weren't moved around as much as the ones from the Temple Mount project. Okay, so we have a total of 33 fragments. 14 legs, nine, uh, nine zoomorphic body parts, two ears or horns, two anthropomorphic heads, one, one pinched and one molded, and even one bed, okay? And we, we didn't find any furniture up on the Temple Mount, or up on, in our project, I mean, because this is also part of the Temple Mount, okay? It's on the Eastern Slope. Now, here's uh, an image of, some of the excavations that took place around Jerusalem and also in other parts of Judah, which have publications of the uh, figurine fragments, okay? So here's the Temple Mount soil on top. Here's the Temple Mount slope, which I just mentioned right now. The Ophel, south, the southern part of the Temple Mount, the City of David has a nice publication. The Western Wall Plaza, the Western Hill, Okay, and a few places from outside of Jerusalem include Moza, Lachish, Be'er Sheva, Tel Ira, and of course, uh, there are others. Now, why am I mentioning also these, these other spots? Um, in the publication of the excavation at Moza, which is just to the west of Jerusalem, uh, uh, Raz Klete, who, who published these figurines, he wrote the following, at border cities, such, such as Tel Batash, the figurine assemblages are more varied. There are few exceptional pieces at Moza, which may indicate imports. The late iron two figurines from Moza testify to the Judean character of this site, 
which is situated close to Jerusalem, the heart of the kingdom of Judah. So basically, he's saying that as you get closer to the heart of Judah, which is in Jerusalem, you have less imports. Okay? More of the figurines represent, if you want, pure or more uh, uh, characteristic, uh, f figurines that are characteristic of Judah. Okay? Now, uh, uh, Michael Press, who published um, Philistine figurines from Ashkelon, but from other places as well, okay? The Philistines lived by the coast. He wrote something very similar. He said that the figurine distribution reflects other kinds of sub-regional distinctions. For example, between Judite influence in the interior and its absence on the coast. So he's basically saying the, sa saying the same thing. As you get closer to the border with Judah, you have more Judite influence. And as you get farther, as you move west towards the coast, you have less Judite influence. Now, besides Judah, all of the nations all around Israel, okay, wait just a moment, all of the nations all around Israel used similar figurines during this time period, during the Iron Age too. However, each region or each nation had figurines that were characteristic to its area, okay, or to its region, even though there were many similarities. So, for example, these are figurines that were found here, you can see in Phoenicia, which is in today's area of the northern coast of Israel and Lebanon, Transjordan, today's Jordan, Philistia, and you can see some of the characteristics of these, of these uh, 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 figurines are different than the ones in Judah. For example, most of the pillar figurines in these nations uh, are hollow, okay? They were made in a mold as opposed to the ones from Judah that are full, the bases are full. In Judah, most of the uh, pillar figurines, their, their faces are pinched, whereas in the nations around Judah, they were mostly made uh, they were in a mold. Okay, like these that you see over here. Now, of course, there are also differences between these different regions, but I'm not going to go into that now. I'm just telling you in general uh, some of these uh, characteristics. Um, we have many figurines that are holding what seems to be a drum in other nations. And in Judah, that's very rare. Okay, we have a continuation in some of these nations, in some of these regions, of plaque figurines, which were very common during the late Bronze Age, during the previous time period. As you move into the Iron Age in Judah, these disappear. They're very rare, okay? These, these are like thin plaque figurines. The ones over here, over here, okay? Peg figurines also are very rare in Judah, but they're quite common in Philistia, okay? Now, also among the zoomorphic figurines, there are differences, okay? The ones from Judah tend to have a more square snout, okay, and less less additions, like plastic additions onto them. You can see here these interesting ones from Philistia, from Phoenicia, from Transjordan. In Judah, they seem to have, uh, they painted on them, but they didn't add any more things. They kept them more simple, if you want. And uh, this is very interesting, uh, okay? These are sites from Israel, excuse me, from Judah, but uh, that are closer to the border, okay? and in these sites, you see more of these foreign influences, okay? So, like I said before, you find figurines in all Judahite sites that are excavated from this time period, okay? But as you're closer to the borders with the other nations, you have more uh, foreign influences. So this is Tel Ira in the south, okay? This is Tel Achish in the southern Shvila. These are peg figurines. From Be'er Sheva, we have these hollow figurines, we have masks, we have this weird sort of uh, hybrid, right? Right over here, you see where I'm pointing? Between a horse figurine, a zoomorphic figurine with a human face. Things like this are very, very rare in Jerusalem, okay? As you get closer to the center of the, of the nation. Okay, so... I want, I want, the, yeah? I want, uh, uh, there's a few questions over here. I can take them now. It's related to what you said. Uh, yes. So I should take some questions now. Let's see. Okay. So uh, no, you, you, you'll continue a little after that. But, but I just want to, uh, to answer these questions now. So uh, Jesse Silberbaum asked if you relate to the P56 picked to the time of Hezekiah or Josiah, 
and the religious reforms, how do you explain the absence of, um, of, uh, of uh, figures, of, of pillar figures? Yeah. Uh, no, there's not an absence of pillar figurines. We have pillar figurines also in uh, P56. There are a few. Uh, and Robert Kerson is asking, is Mozart close with the old city of Jerusalem? Ah, okay, right. I should have... Uh, no, Mozart is about... Um, how much would you say? About maybe uh, 10, about 10 kilometers, kilometers to the west? Hmm? About 10 uh, kilometers. Maybe less. Yeah, Google uh, Maps said it will take you two hours to walk. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and Jesse is asking another... Another question, could you, uh, could the more abstract fi features of the Judaite figure, figurines be related to the biblical prohibition, the prohibition against graven images? Yes, this is an interesting question. And uh, the very famous archaeologist, uh, Bill Deaver, actually um, referred to this. And he believed that this is true. This is exactly what he wrote. He wrote that yeah, and the plaque figurines of the late Bronze Age, you really see, uh, uh, you know, all of the, the women's uh, genitalia, you know, in the private parts, and it's very, like, erotic or very sexual, whereas the pillar figurines during the, the, the biblical time period seem to be more ex abstract and, uh, I would say, less erotic. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's an interesting idea that's been written about. It, it could be. Yes. That's it, you could go on. Okay. So we were just here at, in the city of David, which also has some figurines with these foreign characteristics. Okay, so it, it, the, the city of David has a very, very big publication. They found uh, 1,300 figurine fragments, and several of them were, you know, not your typical Judite ones. But, okay, that's a summary. As we get back, to our excavation, to P56 and the Ophel, right, which are all located actually on the Temple Mount, okay? So our project is within the walls of the Temple Mount. The others are outside the walls, but they're still on the same mountain. We see something very interesting, okay? That the Temple Mount Sifting Project, the Temple Mount Eastern Slope, P56, and the Ophel assemblages include only the basic and characteristic Judean figurine types. The figurines all have a simple and schematic design without engraving or molded decorations. Furthermore, there are no exceptional pieces that may indicate imports from neighboring regions or exhibit foreign influences. Totally absent are hollow pigger figurines, wheel-made figurines, plaque figurines, peg figurines, men figurines, drumming figurines, masks, or other unique heads. We suggest that the reason for the absence of foreign motifs within the Temple Mount Sifting Project figurine assemblage may have stemmed from an ideological rejection of foreign styles during the Iron Age II, which is manifested in the clearest way in the heart of the kingdom and the governmental center on the Temple Mount. Okay, so perhaps it, was, it was, wasn't it was seen as not okay to use these other figurines, but they were in most places and even in Jerusalem. But as you get closer to the center and on the Temple Mount itself, okay, whether it's the temple itself or the other governmental st structures or, building or buildings around it, there it was really prohibited and seen as not okay to use these figurines with the foreign influences. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Um, are there any more questions?